over mountains we find easy care With Feldia or Escort, she marched towards the north For the brown ball of cruelty to clear And the story is told, a warrior of old Cruel and was his name From the north hills and glens, he marched with his men For the famous brown ball to be clear The stories are told of myth and legend of old In the pages of time they belong But still the river runs free through the town of our dee And the legend of the brown bull of Cooley lives on My name is Brendan Matthews. I am chairman of the RD Tidy Town Committee. We have put together this DVD in an effort to record and present some of the natural and developed communities that exist in our town. We also wish to create an awareness and appreciation of the wildlife and natural vegetation that also exists around us. In this recording we have highlighted some of the wonderful work that has been done in our schools and by different sectors of our community in an effort to preserve and regenerate life in these areas. Also included is our heritage walk, our natural walk, wildlife gardens and recreation areas, all of which we have developed over the years. We have also brought to your attention a number of the significant listed trees that grow in our town. A much more comprehensive report of all this can be got in our Ecology Study of RD, published in March 2012. Citation information can be got from many of the four new information panels that we have erected throughout our town. RD Castle RD Castle is the largest fortified medieval townhouse in Ireland. It was probably built by John St. Ledger during the 15th century. It served as a stronghold for the defence of the Pale. RD Railway Station An 8 km railway line once linked the town to the main Dublin-Belfast line. The station opened on August 1st, 1896, and passenger services ended on June 3, 1934. The line continued as a freight service until it finally closed on November 3, 1976. 
The track bed was lifted in the early 80s, but the local Tidy Town Committee have been instrumental in developing the line into a much valued nature walk. Capox Gate The town wall incorporated several gates. They were the Bridge Gate, Ash Walk Gate, Head Gate, Irish Gate and Capox Gate. Another gate is mentioned and was known locally as Blind Gate. Chantry College Walter Verdon, chaplain of RD, established a Chantry College circa 1487. It was intended as a common residence for Chantry chaplains. A Chantry chaplain's first duty was to chant or celebrate Mass daily for a certain individual or family, living or dead. Market Square The square and market house were laid out in 1810. Up until early 1981, RD Town Commissioners met monthly in the old market house. This was demolished in 1987 to make way for a new library. RD House This red brick Georgian house built circa 1780 for the Ruxton family. It is three storeys over a sunk basement. A number of additions have been added to it and it is now used as a hospital for the elderly. St Mary's Church of Ireland This was the site of the parish church in the Middle Ages. In 1315, Edward Bruce burned it when filled with men, women and children. Outside the church, set up on a modern shaft, is the head of an old cross, probable one of the market cross of the town in the Middle Ages. The baptismal font inside the church came from the medieval church of Manfieldstown. Wesleyan Church in 1799, Methodist preachers first arrived in R.D. By 1852, they had built a small Wesleyan church. This was closed in 1976. Hatches Castle This fortified four-storey tower house was built circa 15th or 16th century. It was named after the Hatch family who once owned it. It is not known who originally owned Hatch's Castle. Tower House This was built circa 15th century and is three storeys high with a barrel vaulted ground floor chamber. This tower house stood outside the medieval walls of R.D. Carmelite Friary. This was founded circa 1274 by Ralph Peppard. It is believed that the friary was rebuilt circa 1302. They were granted certain charitable allowances yearly. The last prior, Patrick, surrendered the friary and its possessions on April 30, 1539. The Discalce Carmelites arrived in R.D. in 1639, but only stayed a short while. Foresters Hall This building was the Irish National Foresters Hall, formerly Brady's Mill. The INF were a benevolent organisation who used this hall for meeting and their leisure pursuits. To become a member, it was necessary to pass a medical examination and be of good character. In the event of illness or death to a member, financial assistance would be made available. The Sculpture of Chuchollin and Ferdia This sculpture was erected and funded by Louth County Council and International Fund for Ireland. The artist was Anne Meldon Hugh from Oldcastle. Standing six foot tall, showing Cúchollin carrying in his arms the slain Ferdia, the monument has become synonymous with R.D. and attracts many visitors. The River Dee 
The River Dee is about 27 miles long from Whitewood Lock to Anagassan. It is a fast flowing river with a total fall of 163 feet in its 27 mile length. The whole southern part of the Dee catchment is typical Drumlin country with a great network of channels in narrow valleys between the hills. RD Workhouse Designed by the Poor Law Commissioner's architect, George Wilkinson, the building followed one of his standard designs. RD Poor Law Union was formally declared on the 21st of August 1839 and covered an area of 148 acres. Its operation was overseen by an elected board of guardians representing 13 electoral divisions. A feature of this building is its two roof towers and also its quaint little chapel at the rear, which was used in the years of the workhouse. This building is well maintained today and has still got its charming characteristics. The building later became RD Vocational School and provided education and technical training for the youth of RD and its surroundings for many years. Later, it was bought by Farrells, who have turned it into impressive offices and showrooms adjacent to their factory. St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church There appears to have been an earlier church on this site before the present one was built in 1829. The chancel arch and sanctuary were designed by J.J. McCarthy and added in 1866 in memory of Canon Levens. The church closed in 1974. The Priory of St. John This was founded by Roger Pippard in 1207 and run by the Crouched Friars. In 1340, King Edward III granted to this house a confirmation of its privileges and charters. George Dowdle, the last prior, surrendered it in 1524. He later became Primate of Ireland. The Priory covered the area of Moor Hall, John Street and William Street. Convent of Mercy Known as the High Mill Park and was once part of the domain of St John's Priory. In 1858, three Sisters of Mercy came from Dundalk to occupy the newly built convent which had been designed by John Neville, County Surveyor, Castle Guard, Priest Mount. The Anglo-Norman invaders created the town when they arrived here in the 12th century. On the east side of the town they built or adopted a nine foot high earthwork known as Castle Guard or the Priest Mount as it is known locally. The Jumping Church The Jumping Church is situated about three miles outside RD. Legend has it that a non-Christian had been buried inside the church walls and later that night the gable wall jumped three foot inwards off its foundation leaving the remains outside the sacred area. We're about to enter the grounds of Red House to have a look at some of the trees there and we're in the company of Dr Jerry Douglas, a native of RD. Jerry has spent his whole career looking after trees on the welfare and is an expert in that field. So we're looking forward to the information he's going to impart to us here today. You're very welcome, Jerry. Thank you, Brendan. Thanks a million. Uh, we're here at Red House, as Brendan said, and the very first thing you meet as you come in the gate is a, a, a magnificent cedar tree straight in front of you at the main gate, and it's a cedrus deodara. Uh, it's a native of the Himalaya area, and uh, it um, is known by the fact that the, the tips of the branches dip downwards. So this is the Cedrus Deodar. <laughs> As we walk down the avenue towards the house on our right hand side, you, the first tree we meet is an elm tree, then that's followed by an evergreen oak. And the next one is a very striking tree that you couldn't miss. It's got a very fantastic bark and it's called a tulip tree. And if you look carefully at the leaf, it's got a very, very distinctive leaf. It's not like a maple leaf. It's not like any other leaf that you would know. Um, the Americans call it a, a saddle leaf. 
because it, it looks like a, a leather saddle that you put on a horse. But it's called a tulip tree and it, that's because of the fact that it has flowers on it in the springtime which look like tulips. And it was introduced to Europe from Virginia in North America by John Tradescant, who was a person who collected seeds and got them sent over to England. And he appointed a, a man, a local American, who sent seeds of this tree uh, to Europe, especially to the big landowners in the UK and Ireland, uh, from around 1650. So uh, after that, it, it became a much sought after tree, particularly because of its name. Uh, and it's, it's uh, the tulip tree. People wanted to see tulips growing on a tree. The, the next tree we come to, right in front of the house, is a Lebanon cedar. Cedrus Libani and it's very well uh, recognized from the fact that the branches go out in horizontal tiers and this is a champion it's, a, it's the biggest volume the tallest and the the, the largest girted uh, cedar in, in Ireland and uh, the cedar of Lebanon comes from the Lebanon Mount Lebanon and uh, it's regarded as a sacred tree there uh, a holy tree if you like, uh, it's mentioned many, many times in the Bible, the cedar tree uh, in the Bible. So it, it um, it's a very important tree. But when it was introduced to Europe around very, very early as an ornamental tree, around 1640, I think, um, it was planted and it was grown. And as it grew up, its form became very attractive, this horizontal form of the branches. and. Um, it was very typical 200 years ago to plant a cedar of Lebanon in front of your house. It's the tallest cedar of its kind in the country at 36 metres high and it has a girt of seven and a half metres circumference. So because of the height and because of the girt it has a huge volume and you can only appreciate that by walking underneath the tree and seeing the, the sheer volume of it. It's probably about 70 or 80 tonnes in weight and when you consider that it's been growing for 200 years and uh, collecting carbon dioxide from the air and condensing that gas into solid wood, it's, it's all the more remarkable. Right, so the, the first tree we meet on St Joseph's Avenue is a poplar tree and this is called Populus nigra, or the black poplar. And this particular tree here is 29 and a half meters high and five meters wide. Quite an impressive tree. The, the next tree we meet on the avenue is a copper beech on the left hand side. A very typical of a beech, nice gray bark and the deep copper leaf. Very popular with avenues to big houses and um, these are grown from seed. If you collect seed from a copper beech, uh, you'll get a proportion of them that are copper, or, or else they usually can be grown from grafted plants where you'd graft a shoot from a copper tree. This one looks like it wasn't grafted and was picked out as a copper beech plantlet in its youth, and it was grown on as a big tree as we see today. The next tree we meet just behind the copper beech, and a nice contrast to the copper beech, is this cedar, a deodar cedar. You can see the tips of the branches are, are pointing downwards. And this particular tree here is a nice blue leaf form of it, so it's a cultivated form of the normal deodar cedar. The normal deodar cedar is green, has green leaves, and this one is a nice glaucous blue colour. Yeah, yeah. The next tree we meet on the avenue after the cedar is a lime tree. This is a common lime, uh, Tilia europea. And it's a very important tree for beekeepers because the flowers produce a lot of nectar, which is much sought after by the bees and gives a lot of honey. It was a very important uh, tree in earlier times when the, the bark was cut away and the inner bark was used for making ropes and mats and um, material like that, so it was used as a, as a, as a material. Uh, the wood of the lime tree also was important in times gone by for making very fine uh, carvings, uh, decorative carvings on, on uh, 
uh, household furniture and uh, so on, and especially for making statues where the details of faces and other features could be cut out very, very finely. So uh, this is a nice tree, very common tree, the, the, the lime. Uh, you'll know it because uh, it usually produces a lot of suckers around the base of the tree and it's readily propagated by breaking off suckers and it roots very quickly and very readily and um, uh, as I said before mostly uh, of great value to the beekeepers. So the next tree we meet just after the lime tree on the left hand side is a big pine tree and this is a ponderosa pine from the North Americas and it goes on a huge range from the Rocky Mountains right down to Mexico. Uh, it's quite rare in Ireland to have it actually so it must have been ordered together with all the other ornamental trees by the the, the Ruxton family when they laid out the grounds here. And um, in America it was discovered around uh, relatively early in 1804 by Lewis and Clark. They were American plant explorers who, who went from the east coast of, in Virginia right across the Rockies and they picked it up there along the way and following on from them it was described by David Douglas the famous plant hunter uh, in 1826 and he was the one who sent the seeds of the ponderosa pine back to Europe and the first plants uh, appeared in nurseries uh, in 1827 of this particular uh, pine tree so it gets the name ponderosa from the fact that the wood is rather heavy or ponderous and it was, it's still an important tree in America today. The, the next tree we have on the avenue is a very fine Atlantic cedar and th th these were discovered around 1824 that went into cultivation and they, they are native in the uh, Atlas Mountains in Morocco and Algeria and uh, they were found at high elevations and were distributed again uh, as uh, important trees for their ornamental value mostly. Yeah. Okay. Then the next tree we meet on the avenue here is a very fine turkey oak, uh, Quercus cerus. And it's called turkey oak because it's native in the Balkan areas and goes beyond Turkey in its native distribution. And uh, it's very easy to tell this tree because if you look at the buds, it's got these little hairy uh, projections from it. And there's no other oak tree that has that particular form of the buds. Also, the leaves are very characteristic of, of the turkey oak. Uh, it's an interesting one because when it was introduced into cultivation, uh, it was found to grow very quickly. And there was a lot of high hopes for it when it was brought uh, to northern Europe. It grew very fast. And a lot of people thought that uh, this is a, a better oak species than the native one. But they found that the timbers from it didn't um, perform as well as the, the, the native oak trees. And uh, they, 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 they warped and buckled um, because of the different growing conditions in this part of the world. And uh, it's said that even the timber is no good for burning, that it splinters and, and, and sends out a lot of sparks when you burn it. So, again, uh, it's a tree that had high hopes when it was first introduced into cultivation. But um, subsequently, from a commercial point of view, it hasn't any great value at all. But this is a very fine specimen here, and uh, again, it was planted mostly for its ornamental value. The first tree you see as you come in the gate near the children's playground is a lime tree and also on the left hand side as you come in the gate we've got a lime and behind those we've a group of ash trees and over in the corner there a nice purple plum uh, which you can see there uh, shining through with the sun shining on it, a nice purple leaf. Right, the next group of trees we have walking to our right hand side, the next group of trees facing St. Patrick's Terrace are the a group of sycamores. We've got one, two, three, four, four or five sycamores. A very common tree in Ireland, a very important timber tree, almost as valuable as oak. One single tree of um, sycamore sold in the German markets last November for 54,000 euro for a single stem of sycamore because sycamore is used to make musical instruments and uh, there's occasional trees of sycamore which have a very fine grain uh, with a very beautiful pattern called wavy grain 
and it was one of these trees that was sold for 54,000 euro in the German market and it was sent off to America where it was made into veneer wood. So sycamore, even though it's a very common tree in Ireland, it's one that withstands a lot of wind, it's very suitable to Irish conditions uh, and it's one that should be planted a lot more because of its high value. The next group of trees we have on our left hand side as we walk around are three oak trees, native oaks, Quercus petraea, uh, one from the tidy towns, one's from the, uh, the RD green flag schools and one planted by the president Michael D Higgins in March of this year to launch National Tree Week which was a fabulous day in, our, in RD. Uh, we had huge attendance of people and of course the president being with us on that day was a, a great achievement for the entire committee who organised everything. The, the next tree, we, tree group of trees we meet on the corner just uh, at the courthouse building are a group of hornbeams and they form a lovely avenue and these particular ones are uh, um, especially selected because they have an upright habit so they make a lovely cathedral effect as you walk down through them, uh, the European hornbeam Carpinus betulus. So we have a, no a lovely group of silver birch, and the, the, there's trees of various ages here as we walk down through them. Um, they have the lovely white silvery bark, and uh, Brendan tells me here that a lot of these uh, were collected in the, the, the bog of RD where they seed themselves naturally, and there's lots of seedlings and saplings out there that were donated for planting in the park here. And the birch walk continues right around the periphery of the park on the pathway. And we have a plaque here indicating that these trees were planted in the millennium year, March 2000, by the RD Tidy Towns Committee. On, the, on your right hand side, is just at the birch walk, we're passing the OPW building uh, and also the, the courthouse building and if you look up at the roof on that building you'll see uh, it's covered in red and green small plants and this is a living roof an environmentally friendly roof uh, the idea is that the plants are grown on the roof they collect the water and use the water as the water is made available from the rain um, and it has an insulate they have an insulating property and a cooling property as well on the building and the plants that are used on this uh, roof are grown in a kind of a matting and they seed themselves so they're continuously self-regenerating uh, on, on the roof and they are able to withstand a lot of dry periods as well so the, the, the plants themselves are specially selected that they can use water when the water is available and when there's no water available they're quite happy to, to uh, sit there and look well. And the last group of trees, the last group of trees we meet uh, as we walk right around the, the green is a group of five um, Acer Platinides, Norway maples, the copper leaf version of them that were donated by the RD Credit Union. Uh, these five Norway maples, Acer Platinides, Crimson King, were donated by the RD Credit Union because they represent the five decades, 50 years, that the Credit Union has been in operation in the town. We're, we're now at the old rectory in RD looking at elm trees. There's a group of four very big mature elm trees and uh, these are very unusual and very rare because of the type of alum that they are. They're almost levis, they're a European white alum and they're unusual in that they're a native of Europe, they're not planted throughout Ireland much and we were very fortunate to identify these about five years ago uh, when the trees were producing seed and the seed have a little stalk on them which indicates they're, that they're a European white alum. And elm used to be very important uh, because it was used, had many, many uses, especially in connection with water, used for making the keels of ships. It was used as pylons under London Bridge, uh, making the seatings of chairs and many, many other uses. But all are big elm trees. Uh, that's the native witch elm and many of the other elms are now dead because of Dutch elm disease. And as you can see, these specimens here are very fine and very much alive. Uh, they, they have not been affected by Dutch elm disease even though many of the native 
alum species around the town have been killed. So the, the mystery is twofold really. Where did they come from? Who brought the seeds from Europe? Did they come as seeds or seedlings? Or did somebody buy them from a nursery uh, on the continent? Or um, uh, that's the first mystery. The second mystery is how they haven't been affected by Dutch elm disease. And there's a number of theories on that. And my favourite one is uh, to do with the fact that they're, un they're an un unusual species. And because of that, they've managed to escape. Dutch elm disease is transmitted from one tree to another by a flying beetle. And when the beetle emerges from a tree as a larvae, it zones in, zones in on a tree of the same type that it came from. So I think that the flying beetles that were around RD didn't recognise the smell or the aroma that came off these European alums. So they just passed them by and in that way they managed to escape the Dutch alum disease. So they're, they're very, very um, uh, unusual to see mature alums like this in uh, in a town and we, we treasure them much in RD because of that and um, we're very lucky to have them and the Jennings family are very helpful in insofar as they, they allow anyone to come in and inspect them and enjoy them uh, in the town. Okay Jerry, thanks very much for your information, very interesting, thank you for coming down to us today. You're very, very welcome Brendan, it was a pleasure to come down and enjoy the trees around RD and I hope the people of the town enjoyed them as well and thanks to you and your committee and to Danny Martin for doing our filming today as well. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. The Tree Launch To celebrate National Tree Week March 2011, members of the Tidy Town Committee, the Active Retirement Group and the local schools and invited guests took part in a Piper-led march through RD. Later in the year, these efforts and the committee's work in promoting awareness and appreciation of trees won the National Award for Trees in the Tidy Town competition. The following year, on March 7, 2012, we were honoured by the Tree Council of Ireland. We were chosen to host the launch of National Tree Week by President Michael D. Higgins. The arranging of the event was a big undertaking, but with the joint efforts of the Tree Council of Ireland, Loud County Council and many local groups, the event was a tremendous success. Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to give your warmest warm welcome to the President of Ireland. I knew it.
So, it is with great pleasure then that I launch the Ecology of RD and the Ecological Plan, and you will presumably win the All Ireland title with this next year. You have done so very well. Good evening, the Bayek of Galea. Moorhall Lodge Retirement Village has been propagating an intergenerational garden. Project through spring 2012, the project is called Growing Through the Ages and involved residents from the retirement village and students from Skullmurna Throkra who jointly planted three gardens which have biodiversity themes included in the edible and flower beds. The gardens were designed jointly by residents of Moorhall Lodge Retirement Village and RD Tidy Towns Committee. Skullmura Nathrokra RD This is our seventh green flag. We earned our seventh green flag on the biodiversity team. We are very lucky. We are the first school in County Loud to get seven green flags. This is our Galon Galon tag. It was created by 6th class 2012. It celebrates biodiversity in our school and our interest for the environment. We have many mature trees on our school grounds, each of which are labelled as part of our tree trail. Each year we celebrate National Tree Week. This is our, this is our butterfly village. We, there's, there's many smells and, and colours so then it will attract, attract the butterflies. This is one of the many colourful summer boarders in our school and as you can see it's a fabulous resource for teaching and learning and we are very proud of the mature grounds we have here in Scullower and Atrocra RD. These are organic vegetable plots. We grow them from seed. These are potatoes, our celery, our onions, our peas and many more. This is our water bush. We 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 use the water to water our vegetables. This is our biodiversity area. It includes a heritage Irish apple trees, a herb garden, fruit bushes, and a wildflower area. This is our fruit bush area. Here you can see how we mulch around our fruit bushes. We use recycled cardboard and on the top we either use grass cuttings or our own organic compost. This is our new bird mansion. We observe our native birds when they come to feed from the bird feeders. This is our insect hotel. The Green Schools Committee created the insect hotel with some recyclable materials and it's a lovely home for animals and insects and it's called the Creepy Crawly Towers. These are heritage apple trees. We got these from the Irish Seed Savers Association. We got these when they are only small. Now they are very big. We labelled each tree. This is our dead hedge hotel. We have put fallen branches and shrub cuttings in here. It is an amazing habitat for insects and wildlife. It is part of our biodiversity tree trail. This is our school herb garden and as you can see all the herbs have been labelled Osperla and Osgelga. Another valuable educational resource on our school grounds and it's also part of our biodiversity trail. Monastery Boys School RD and um, this is our water butt that holds 210 litres. It collects rain from the roof and when it overflows it goes back down the drain. And this is our baby greenhouse. We plant everything from seed in it. And uh, these four ones here are potatoes and the two ones at the back are strawberries. We got these this uh, wood from chippings from the church. The trees were cut down, and we. And this is our herb garden. We we grow mint, garlic, peppermint, uh, peppermint and. Um, we have seaweed water. Um, we get seaweed from the beach, and we put it into the the old milk cartons, and uh, we get the water from the water butt, and. Um, we don't have to keep on going to get more seaweed because it lasts a long time. And we uh, water all our plants with the seaweed water. 
and beside the seaweed water there's a compost up and um, we put all our skins and grass in the composter. And now we're just coming up to the wildlife garden. Um, we have the insect motel here and we have little tubes where the insects stay and um, we have leaves in here as well so the insects can go in there and um, it keeps them dry as well. Yeah, I'm talking. And we have a wildlife notes board to tell you all the animals that live here and to tell you about um, all the, the insect motels and the bird houses. And we have bird houses up there because last winter um, when we came back there was lots of dead birds on the tarmac because they had no food to eat. And before, before